So let's uh, quickly get into question three. Uh, finish this one from session one, and then we'll jump into uh, session two today. Okay, I'm gonna change a bit of pace today, um, and that's because um, I, yeah, uh, I saw as I said, I need to finish up question three and then start session two. But you'll see, paper two goes a lot quicker. Um, I've done a lot of legwork, or we've done a lot of legwork in paper one, so paper two should go a lot easier, right? So I gave you guys a bit of homework yesterday, and I hope you did it because if you did. You're going to get a lot more value out of the session. And my first hope is that you obviously did the whole question. If you didn't do the whole question, I at least hope that you do the graph, as I said. But I'm going to go through this question as uh, quickly as I can. Um, and then just uh, mention a few pointers here. All right. I do want to inform you guys that you will have access to the recording. Uh, later on, you will get the memo of the learner's book as well. So you really don't have to stress if you feel like you're not following or I'm going a bit too fast. You will have an opportunity to go through it at your own pace. And then obviously, you can always just replay this um, recording for yourself just to catch up again. OK, so if we were on the same page, let's kick off with question three. Question three says study the diagram below and answer the questions that follow. So here you're looking at the eye. And if you remember my instruction from yesterday is that the first thing you do when we look at the eye is or any diagram in fact is that you are going to label okay so if you look at diagram one here you see there is label a b and c and if we just label it quite quickly we'll know that a is the suspensory ligaments b would be your lens and then obviously c would be your blind spot okay so you always label that at first and then you will see next to that is diagram two. And you'll notice here that the eye is doing something from in terms of the pupil that's getting bigger. So you need to know that something is happening there. All right. So question one says the um, retina is the light sensitive layer of the eye where the images are formed. Explain why no image is formed at C. So if you look at C, as I explained to you earlier, C is the blind spot. So why would there not be any um, image being formed there? There are no photoreceptors or, or rods and cones in the blind spot. Okay, so that would be your answer for C. Quite simple. And then 3.1.2 says with reference to the structure labeled A and B, what? A was the suspensory ligaments and B was the lens. So you must now know that because you have labeled it. Remember, you always label before you even look at the question. So now I know A is the um, suspensory ligament or ligaments and B is the lens. So now I must use those two words. Don't say A and B. Well, you can, but try and use the words because you've labeled it and then answer the question using the words. You must explain the accommodation that will take place when a person is being an object that is close to him. OK, so now obviously you guys know what would happen when you're viewing something closer than six meters. It has the story to do with the lens. It's going to either slack uh, sorry, there's uh, some spins ligaments that will slacken. It will make the lens more convex and it will allow more, um, it will change the, the shape of the lens. So we will look at it once in a second, but just keep that um, at the back of your mind for now. I just want to go to 3.1.3 as well. When you look at diagram two, okay, now in diagram two, you are not focusing on the lens now, okay? You must be very careful here when you see something like diagram two. Diagram two, you see that there is the eye and then you are looking at the pupil of the eye. OK, the pupil is the dark part of the eye and you can see the pupil gets bigger as you go from the first image to the second image. So the pupil is dilating and that should remind you of something we call the pu pupillary mechanism where the pupil gets a bit bigger. And I want to ask you and we'll see who's the quickest on the chat. What is the person going into? Is the person going for is the person going into uh, from bright light to dim light or from dim light to bright light. Okay, that's what I want you to think about. Is the person going from a dark room to a light room or dim light to bright light or from bright light to dim light? And that's going to help you to orientate yourself in terms of those answers there. Okay, so I'm going to quickly share the um, memo for this one over here. So we're looking at 3.1 or question 3.1. And as I explained, 3.1.1 has to do with there are no photoreceptors. And remember, you have to mention the word photoreceptors. That is very, very important. Let me just take that away. And then also, um, you can also say there are no rods and cones for 3.1.1. Okay, and therefore, there is no vision 
in that region. And in 3.1.2, remember, I ask you to um, label A was the um, spinsery ligament. So you can say A um, will slacken. So that's quite important to remember there that the spinsery ligament slacken and then the tension on the lens will decrease. And therefore, the lens becomes more convex and more rounded. And therefore, the refractive power of the lens increases. And that is three marks over there. Okay, if there's anything that's unclear, please let me know, guys. I'll be happy to go over it again. And then 3.1.3, I've seen nothing in the chat so far, but the question was um, you had to explain what is happening in the diagram. So let's go to the diagram again. In diagram two, you can see that in diagram two, um, <clears throat> you have to name the process taking place and explain how the process um, shown in the diagram occurs. Okay, so if we look at diagram two, we know, as I explained, the process is called pupillary mechanism. And you just have to first understand when the pupil dilates, when I say dilate, I mean the pupil becomes bigger, okay? Then you are going from a, from a bright light to dim light, okay? So the person is going from bright light to dim light. How do I know it is dim light or less light? Because um, the, the pupil has dilated, meaning it has become bigger. So when the pupil becomes bigger, it wants to allow more light into the eye. All right. So knowing that, we know that the system or the mechanism is called pupillary mechanism. That's important to remember. So I'm just going to highlight that. And we know what happens is the radial muscles will, contra will contract um, of the iris and the circular muscles will relax. It's very important that you don't confuse those two things, grade 12. Study this well. And um, if you if you get lost or if you get confused or if um, you're not sure, um, go to your mind mind the gap uh, textbook. Okay, okay. that's going to explain it very, very nicely. Is there a question? I'm hearing someone speaking. Okay, no, I'm not hearing that person or whoever speaking anymore. So radial muscles contract, circular muscles relax, the pupil dilates, becomes bigger and it allows more light into the eye. Okay, simple as that, um, nothing difficult there. Okay, let's move on. We are now by 3.2, and for 3.2, it says, um, let me just get this up quickly. So a little bit slow on the screen side, there we go. So 3.2 says an investigation was done to test the relationship between the thickness of the lens and the focal length of the lens, and the data in the table gives you the focal length of six lenses which have the same diameter but different thickness okay so here now you need to draw a line graph so what i asked you guys to do yesterday for me is to draw this line graph so i want you to go to this line graph and let's quickly check about this line graph and how you must draw a graph in general okay so let me just put up the booklet here we go so i'm gonna zoom in Sir? quite a bit yeah can you go a little bit slower? Your pace is a touch too fast. No problem will do. Thank you. Okay, I'm assuming you guys can see the graph quite clearly. Yeah, okay. So when you draw a graph, typically you're gonna have about six marks um, more or less in a graph. And I'm gonna put this graph up so that you guys can see where your marks will be given. So the first order of business is that when you draw your graph, you have to draw the graph that they are requesting you to draw, okay? And the question asks you to draw a line graph. So that's the first thing you do. You draw a line graph, don't draw histogram, don't draw a bar chart, you draw a line graph. That's point one, and you're gonna get a mark for that. Point number two is that your graph will have a heading, okay? And the heading in this graph will read graph showing the relationship between the lens thickness and the focal length. Now, if you don't know this, your heading must always have both variables in that title or in the heading. What variables am I talking about? The variables on the y-axis, which is the focal length, and the variable on the x-axis, which is the thickness. And you can clearly see it says um, lens thickness and focal length. Line graph is not a heading. So if you just write the line graph, that's not a heading. If you write um, the focal length of, length of six different lenses, that's not a, a correct heading. Your heading must always have the thickness and the focal length, so always both variables in it. So always variable Y and variable X. That's the first thing. Okay, so heading, you will get a mark for if both variables are in there, 
and then you get a mark if you drew the correct graph, which is a line graph. All right, moving on to your um, axis. So on the X axis, which is your horizontal axis over here, you need to label that correctly. And that will be thickness of the lens in millimeters. And then on your Y axis, which is your vertical axis, that would be your focal length. Okay, you get a mark for labeling. The um, second last mark you'll get is for the scale. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this slowly and I hope you guys are taking note of this. When you make a scale, you must remember that your scale must have the same interval. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you start on the X axis with one and my mouse goes says on one, then you must continue in one. So it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five. Okay, if you start with one and you continue with twos, meaning you go one, two, four, six, eight, you lose the mark for the scale on the X axis. Why? Because you are not having the same interval. So whatever number you start with, you must maintain that number, meaning you must maintain the correct interval. Okay, likewise for the Y axis, we start at zero um, and then we start at five. Now, if you chose to start at 10, that's okay. Just remember to continue with the number that you start with. So many times learners make the mistake. They start with five and then they go five, 10, 20, 30, etc. That's not correct. Okay. You start with five, you continue with five. So five, 10, 15, 20. If you start with 10, you continue with 10, 10, 20, 30, etc. Okay. Not 10, 15, 20. You start with 10, you continue with 10. And that's extremely important, grade 12, is that whatever number that you start with, you continue. Don't jump numbers and make sure that your intervals are always by the same number. So if it's five, it continues with five. If it's one, it continues with one. And I hope that that makes a bit of sense to you guys. Please do note that quite carefully. And then the last mark is for plotting. So that just means plotting your graph accurately. And when you've plotted your points, as you can see here, the blue line with the dots, um, then you connect the dots always, and that would be your line graph, okay? Very important that you don't um, start your line from zero and then start at zero and then draw a line to that first um, plot point there. You start your line where the first plot point is. Don't ever, ever start at zero. The maths or the maths, the teachers might fight with me on that one, but in life sciences, we start by that point and you connect your dots, okay? And you can use a ruler to connect the dots. That would be the best. Um, it's never wise to connect the dots freehand. Use a ruler and connect the dots, all right? And here at the bottom, I can just show you the rubric. Here you can see drawing the correct type of graph, one mark, the caption, that's the heading, one, the correct label on the X axis, including the scale. So remember now what I said, you start with one, you continue with one. You don't go one and then four and then seven and then, no. You continue with the same number. Uh, that will be a mark. And then correct uh, label for the Y axis, including the scale. Once again, you start with five, you continue with five. You start with 10, you continue with 10. Okay, and that's a mark there. And then finally plotting, one to two points correct. That would only be one mark, all six points plotted. That would be full marks, as you can see over there. All right. And then finally, just if you drew the wrong graph, so for example, you drew a bar graph or you drew a histogram, hopefully nothing else, you only lose one mark for the type of graph. But if everything else is okay, you still get your marks. All right. I want to pause here for just five or so seconds to ask, is there any questions about the graph in um, in particular, or any questions about the work um, up until this point that I need to go over for anyone? There are no questions in the chat so far, sir. Thank you so much. Then I will assume you guys can continue. You guys are welcome to just give a thumbs up as well. If you are okay, um, then I can also get feedback to see that you guys are okay. All right. Um, just on 3.2.2, state the relationship between the thickness and the focal length. So over here, um, you simply had to say, if you look at these numbers over here, I just want to zoom in for you guys so that's nice and big. You can see the thickness is decreasing. Hopefully you see that, 10, 9, 8, blah, blah, blah. And the focal length is increasing. So simply put, 
um, as the focal lens increases, the focal, sorry, as the thickness of the lens increases, the focal length um, will decrease, or as the thickness of the lens decreases, the focal length will increase. Anything along those lines would be correct. And let me just put that up so you guys can see. There we go. As the thickness of the lens increases, the focal length decreases. Okay. Uh, moving on to just the ear. So for 3.2, uh, if you guys have worked through this already, I want to start out by asking if there is anything unclear or in particular I need to focus on. You are welcome to ask me now. Otherwise, I will just go through the questions um, and explain to you a few tips. But if there's anything you need me to explain about the ear, I'll be very happy to address that particular question for anyone. Okay, so what was rule number one when you have a diagram? Before you look at the questions, your first um, point of order is you are going to label this diagram. Okay, and I'm just going to change text to show this uh, PowerPoint presentation so I can have all the questions up. There we go. So first order of business, you label. You just go nuts and label. Even if you not ask the labels, you go nuts and you label it. So I'm going to go through the labels just very quickly because I know you guys know your work. Label A would be the auditory canal. B. I'm would... sorry. I'm very sorry to disturb you, sir. There's a question. Uh huh. From a school. Okay. Can you please start over with 3.1.1? The one 3.1.1 only. Um, or is it um, one or two que or a, a specific question under question three? Um, it says 3.1.1. Okay, no problem. So I'm at 3.1.1. The question reads, the retina is the light sensitive layer of the eye where images are formed. Explain why there is no image at C. So the first thing you need to ask yourself is what is C? Okay. And my instruction to you is you always label your diagrams even before you get to the question. And if you remember, the label of C was the blind spot. Isn't it so? So the blind spot is the photoreceptors in the blind spot. The answer is no. Okay, where do you find the photoreceptors in the eye? You would only find them at the fovea centralis or at the layer at the back of the eye, which we refer to as the um, retina. So that's the only place where there is photoreceptors. So because the um, image is only formed with the photoreceptors is, then you can only have an image there. So you can't have an image at point C. All right. And then with reference of structure A and B, now we're looking at the lens, which is B, and we're looking at A, which is the um, suspensory ligaments. You must now explain how accommodation occurs. And accommodation is something you would have learned already. That is when the suspensory ligaments slacken, the lens will become but more convex, and then more light enters the eye. All right. And if, you, if you're if still a bit confused with this, just work through it on your own, perhaps, and then to just come back over it. But this is something you would have been taught. 3.1.3 um, was you had to name the process taking place in diagram two. I said you have to look at what's happening in diagram two. You're looking at the pupil. How do I know it's the pupil? It's the dark part of the eye. And the pupil is getting bigger, so it's dilating. And because the pupil is dilating, we are looking at the mechanism called the pupillary mechanism. And that is also laid out quite nicely for you. You would have been told that you are coming from very um, uh, bright light. When the pupil is small, the light is bright to very dim light. So the pupil is a bit bigger. And then you have to explain what is taking place over those changes. Okay. And I did put that up. I'll just put it up again for you guys. Uh, you will have this available. Uh, here we go. It is the radial muscles that contract and the circular muscles that relax. And then the circular and then the pupil will dilate. Okay. I hope that makes a bit more sense for you guys over there. Um, I'm happy to um, answer that question again, but I think that makes sense. Um, and then we just spoke about the graph now. Okay. And I mentioned what is important there. Just to show it to you guys again. Um, it's down here. There we go. So the important was the heading, uh, the labels and the scale, as well as the X and the Y for both of them. And then the plotting part of it. Okay. 
Uh, I did ask if you guys go through this yesterday. Um, if if uh, you guys didn't get a chance, no stress. Uh, go over it um, in your own time, and then just come back over the recording. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I don't see any questions. Um, you may continue, sir. Okay, thank you. The resources will be shared with you guys, the memo as well as the recording, so you don't have to stress about it. Um, the main aim is just to, to get through uh, a few things with you guys. It's impossible for me to do everything in detail. We're not going to finish, unfortunately. So I'm going to touch and go where I can. And if there's anything you can always see in the chat, please go over that again, and I will. But uh, also understand, guys, um, in the hour and a half, it's impossible for me to, to go through it in as much detail as I would like to um, because of time constraints. Okay, so just coming back to the ear. So you've labeled now all the different parts of the ear. And then question 3.1 uh, says you must give the labels for A, B, and D. Um, so obviously, A, B, and D, as, you, as I ask you now to do already, you need to um, have labeled it. So, you know, A would be the external auditory canal. Um, B would be the tympanum or the tympanic membrane. And then D would be your oval window. Okay. It's always uh, uh, for learners always get confused between the oval window and the round window. So you must remember the oval window will always be before the round window. So we can think about it as O before R in the alphabet. So D is the oval window, and then over here at the bottom, the, that would be your round window. Okay. For 3.3.2, um, you just have to give the function of um, C and F. So again, you need to know what C is, and C would be um, part of the ossicles. If you remember correctly, C would be the hammer, and the hammer would um, uh, amplify the sound or trans uh, support transport or transfer the vibrations from the hammer to the anvil or to the incus, which is the bone next to that. Likewise with if, what am I looking at by if? I'm looking at um, the auditory nerve and that takes impulses to the brain. Okay, 3.3.3, is there any questions from anyone for 3.3.3? That was uh, straightforward. I'm not gonna go through that if there aren't any questions. I just wanna focus on 3.3.4. But um, if there are any questions for 3.3.3, I'd be happy to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to jump to 3.3.4, which has to do with maintaining balance. OK, I'm going to assume you guys are OK, so I'm going to jump to 3.3.4. So um, you will always be asked how, how the ear helps to maintain balance um, or hearing, one of those two. And I highly recommend that you guys study both hearing and both balance. Okay, those are the two things that are critically important when it comes to the ear. Um, and those are nice marks because you can just study that from exam guideline. They are what we call your bread and butter marks. So if we look at 3.3.4, um, when you speak about balance, you need to refer to a few things. And I'm just going to highlight them because I know you guys will work through this on your own or you have already. So Excuse the me, first sir? thing, yeah. Can you slow down the pace, please? Okay, I will manage. And will can do. you zoom in a little bit more? And we have another question. Can you please review 3.3.3? 3.3.3, exactly. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, I will do that one first then. So let's go to 3.3.3. 3.3.3 speaks about earwax. Okay, so if I look at the ear, let's just go to the ear. So here's a diagram of the ear. 3.3.3 says um, part A secretes earwax called cerumen. So that's the, the scientific name of the earwax. And we know that the wax sometimes forms a solid plug against part B. So let's just go to the ear. And who can remember what was part B? I think I did label it at some point. Anyone in the chat want to just quickly throw out what part B was, because that's going to help you answer the question. Right, so we'll, we'll get back to part B in a second. Okay, so you must give um, two functions of cinnamon, meaning you have to say what is the function of earwax. Okay, so earwax typically, we know if you, 
I know you have intuitors that's going to help keep um, insects out. For example, that's the first one. It also traps dust. So if you say anything along the line of it traps dust for 3.3.3 um, or it prevents insects, meaning um, it keeps out insects, you would be correct. Okay, so trapping dust and um, getting insects or keeping insects out of the ear, that would be the correct answer. I was waiting for part B from anyone. I see, uh, there we go, Proteus Technical High School gave it to us, the tympanic membrane. That's absolutely correct. So now, if you look at this question, it says uh, the part, part B is now being affected, okay? So it says, explain the effect of hearing if the waxy plug formed against part B is gonna be there. So we know part B is the tympanic membrane. So now you need to ask yourself, all right, if I have a buildup of wax here at part B, what is that gonna influence? So what is the function of the tympanic membrane? We know when you hear sounds, it's gonna hit the tympanic membrane and the tymp tympanic membrane is gonna start to vibrate. But if there's wax that builds up in your auditory canal, the question you must ask yourself is, will the sound get to the tympanum? Obviously it won't get there as effectively, so your answer should be around sound not reaching the tympanum or the tympanum not vibrating properly. Okay, so because of that, we know that hearing will worsen or hearing will not be as effective as I explained now. So that's going to lead to deafness, right? And this may result in the hamper of free movement, meaning the tympanic membrane won't vibrate as freely. And because it doesn't vibrate as freely, that is going to cause hearing to be weakened or to be softer or to have no sound. So anything along the lines of deafness, tympanum doesn't vibrate, and that's going to lead to um, not hearing properly or deafness, you will get the mark for that. Okay. So that's what happens when you have a buildup of wax. Okay. Interesting enough, when if you guys love sitting with headsets, headphones, headsets, I don't know if you've noticed, but if you listen to lots of music over headsets, then your wax builds up. You would have more earwax than normal. And that is actually why people that listen to lots of music over headsets later in their life have an increased chance of going deaf because of the buildup of wax. So if you've ever listened to your headsets and your mommy or daddy calls you and you didn't hear them and they think you're lying, you can tell them this is the reason why, because the earwax builds up in your ear and you actually can't hear so well when you take out the headsets. Okay, that was for 3.3.3. Um, 3.3.4, now we buy the balance part. Um, are we clear now with 3.3.3? If you can just give a thumbs up or if you want me to um, recap anything, I will, but I'm gonna assume you guys are okay with 3.3.3, the effect of wax on hearing. So besides hearing, you will be asked about balance um, and the role of maintaining balance in the ear is perfectly given to you in your exam guideline. Um, it has to do with the Christia. So I just wanna show you guys quickly what you need to mention. So balance has to do with one thing and that has to do with the Christa and the semicircular canals that will um, control or respond with the movement of the head. Okay, so when I think about balance as a learning grade 12, the one thing that must pop into my mind is the Christa, because you get a mark for that always. And the second thing that must, that must be um, jumping to my mind is the semicircular canals. Okay, so those are the two things that's going to play a major role in balance. So they are stimulated by the change of speed and direction. You must mention that grade 12s. You can't just say they stimulated by movement. Okay, you have to say speed and direction because that's 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 where the mark is. Um, then the crystal converts the stimuli into a nerve impulse. We know that the nerve impulse must now go to the brain, but it doesn't just jump to the brain. The nerve impulse will be transported along the auditory nerve. And then from the auditory nerve, the nerve impulse will go to the cerebellum. Please write this down somewhere. Do not write the brain. Do not say the brain. So if you said here, yeah, I'm just going to do this quickly. If you said brain here, yeah, that's going to be incorrect. Okay, please do not write brain because you have to say it goes to the cerebellum. 
just for interest sake, who can tell me where does sound go to in your brain? That's also a question they can ask you how sound travels. If you know, just let me know in the chat. Sound, does it also go to the cerebellum or does it go to somewhere else in the brain? But for balance, always mention the brain. So let's just recap again. The crystal will be stimulated in the semicircular canals. There's your first two marks. Um, they respond to speed and direction. There's your next mark. Um, the crystal converts the stimuli into an impulse. You must say that. That's your third mark. Sorry, your fourth mark. And then those impulses travel along the auditory nerve and they go to the cerebellum, not the brain. I see um, cerebrum is in the chat. That's correct. Sound goes to cerebrum um, and balance goes to the cerebellum. Are we okay there, grade 12s? Just give a thumbs up if you guys are okay or just let me know if I need to go over anything for you again. Otherwise, I'm going to assume you guys are quite okay over there. Any questions from anyone with regards to the ear? Anything I need to um, recap or anything you want me to go over in terms of the ear? Uh, just a second quickly, sir. Um, no to the teachers in the classroom, you will see that there's a little hand, little smiley face with a hand, and that's where you can raise your hand and also show the reactions like the thumbs up and the hearts and the clapping. There we go. So, if you want to interact with sir in this way, you can do that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And please do, guys, please. I'm not uh, at all offended if you want me to slow down or just to say go over this again and go over that again. Um, I would be happy to do that for you guys. Okay. I'm just, like I said, um, changing pace because of time, but I will happily slow down and I'll happily go over anything again for you guys. Um, so that's the year wrapped up. We're going to go to 3.4, which has to do with the blood vessels. And um, over here, once again, you need to know your um, thermal regulation quite well when it comes to this. Okay, so it says the diagram below represents the skin showing the transverse section through uh, blood vessels. And you have to um, now be able to interpret this as it shows you that a person is exposed to different environmental conditions. So you'll see over here, it says the epidermis, which is the top layer. Let me actually put up, um, okay, I can't highlight this because it's, it's a picture, um, but you can see the epidermis over there on top. Then you have the dermis, then you have circles here. So these sort of medium circles, then there's small circles in the middle, and then there's huge circles at the end. And it shows you that the circles is the blood vessels under normal conditions. So that's normally. And then you have uh, blood vessels under environment condition X. So they're a bit smaller, which means that your blood vessels are smaller. Okay. Or the diameter of the blood vessels are smaller. And then it shows you uh, blood vessels under environmental conditions Y. And you can see the blood vessels are dilated. Dilated simply means it's bigger. And so um, you can then now answer the questions on that okay sorry i see there's a question in the chat uh the memo for 3.1.1 and 3.2.2 not a problem um if i can ask i'm going to put this memo up not a problem if um the rest of you guys that did the memo already or saw it already if you can just look at 3.4.1 and 3.4.3 .3, i will just put the memo up for 3.1.1 briefly um it's 3.1.1 okay and the rest of you guys can just look at those uh two questions for me there's the memo i'm gonna leave it up for about 10 seconds or so Right, so you guys will have access to this memo, um, but I'm just putting it up there for you guys to, to quickly see it if you didn't get a chance to, 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 to look at it, but the memo will come to you guys in due time, okay, so don't worry about it. So 3.4.1, it says describe the environmental condition at X, okay, so if I look at X, X is the one in the middle, you now must compare the circles, which is the blood vessels, with normal conditions, so under normal conditions, which is the first picture, in the condition X, the circles is smaller. So what is happening? The blood vessels is getting narrower. That should remind you of a condition called vasoconstriction. 
And who can tell me um, this vasoconstriction happen when you are warm or this vasoconstriction happen when you are cold? Just think about that, okay? And then obviously condition Y, the, the, um, the vessels are broader and that's called vasodilation. And now you must think, okay, when does vasodilation happen? When I'm hot, when I'm cold, when I'm wherever? And that's gonna help us here. So describe the condition at X. We know it's cold. And I see there's a few things coming to in the chat. Um, and it's cold because the blood vessels are smaller. Okay. Um, I see a question in the chat from Perseverance. Will the blood vessels be illustrated with circles only? Not necessarily. Um, they can show you a picture of the skin where you can actually see the, the blood vessels in the form of vessels. But if it is circles, then you need to know it's blood vessels. Okay. Um, so condition X, the environmental condition there is cold because the blood vessels are narrower, um, smaller, and condition Y where it's but, but bigger, that's going to be where it's warm. So the answer for 3.4.1, you must only focus on condition X. And as I explained, condition X would be cold. And the reason for that is the blood vessels are narrow or you are experiencing um, vasoconstriction for 3.4.1. 3.4.2, what is represented by the arrows? So the arrows represent heat being lost. Okay, that's just heat being lost normally. And then 3.4.3, I'll show the memo now. So don't, don't worry if, if you guys are not um, writing it on fast enough. 3.4.3 says name the process that is represented in the diagrams that maintains a constant body temperature. Now, I know because your teacher taught you well that the word that's going to jump in your head will be homeostasis. Okay, because you're going to think homeostasis helps to maintain um, the things in the body. Okay, but because we are looking at um, blood vessels and because we are dealing with hot and cold, homeostasis would be incorrect. It would be incorrect. And I know that's going to jump in your brain. The correct answer would be thermoregulation. Okay, because that is the type of homeostasis that helps maintain body temperature. So whenever you are asked about um, body temperature, I want you guys to remember to always write thermoregulation. And I'll show the memo now in a second. It's not homeostasis, okay? And the reason it's not homeostasis is because they're asking you a specific type of um, process and they're showing it to you in the diagram. And that's why it is not referred to as homeostasis. Okay, I hope that makes a bit of sense to you guys. Um, 3.4.4, I'll show the memo after this says describe how the skin of a person under environment condition Y maintains a constant body temperature. Now you're going to remember I said condition Y, I asked you, is it hot or is it cold? That's going to be hot, okay, because the blood vessels are wider and you can see that, um, as, as I said, the word we are using here is vasodilation. So the condition Y is when the person is under warm conditions. And now you must explain how the body will change or how the change the body will go through to maintain um, a warm environment or not to maintain it, sorry, to allow the body to cool down. Um, so well, what are you going to talk about here? There's a few things. You can talk about sweat. You can talk about blood flowing to the skin. You can talk about the hair follicles standing up or relaxing. There's lots of stuff you can talk about, okay? But because the diagram because the diagram shows you blood vessels, you must talk about blood flow. Why blood flow? Because the diagram shows you blood vessels. You can't talk about hair follicles. That's going to relax because there is no hair follicles in the diagram. You can talk about sweat, and I'll show you guys the, the answers now, but sweat relating to the blood flow. So when you see a diagram that has to do with blood vessels, your answer when you have to explain thermoregulation must be with regards to blood vessels. Okay, that's extremely important to understand. So let's just look at that quickly. Um, under 3.4, uh, 3, 3 so as I explained, it was cold conditions um, because of the blood vessels. The arrows uh, represent heat loss. And in the answer for 3.4.3 is thermoregulation and not homeostasis. Why not homeostasis? because um, they are already giving you a type of um, homeostasis or they're giving a diagram showing that. 3.4.4, remember now, we know that more blood will flow to the skin 
Um, and we know that because more blood flows to the skin, you're going to sweat more. So your answer will read as following, or you will write an answer relating to any of the following points. The blood vessels will widen, and you could see that from the diagram, meaning it becomes broader. Okay, and you saw that with the big circles. So that's the first point you mentioned. You mentioned what you see. I'm just going to go back again. There we go. So what do I see? I see the blood vessels are larger. So I say the blood vessels are wider or they become larger, right? What you see, so they widen. So more blood flows to the surface of the skin. That's very important to understand and to mention. Therefore, you lose more heat. And because you lose more heat, more blood also flows to the sweat glands. And because there's more blood in the sweat glands, you will sweat more or more sweat is secreted and that causes cooling or evaporation. Okay, so you mentioned what you see. I can see that the blood vessels are widening. So I mentioned that and you can see you get a point for mentioning that the skin widen or the blood vessels of the skin widen. More blood flows to the surface of the skin, heat, more heat is lost, more blood flows to the sweat glands, more sweat is secreted and then obviously evaporation of sweat causes cooling. Okay, and that was for that one. Okay, uh, any questions for 3.4 or for thermoregulation? Otherwise, we're going to wrap it up with the last one, which is this experiment. Okay, I see no questions in the chat. Um, if there's any questions, please just let me know. Okay. So for this experiment, um, you will always be given an experiment in the um, paper one, okay? I'm not gonna go through the whole experiment. I'm just gonna mention a few things here briefly. And when you deal with, with an experiment, the first thing you have to do is you have to obviously read the experiment quite carefully. So we know that the experiment has to do with a grade 12 learner, Lim Sejo, that is investigating the effect of plant hormones on growth. Um, and then they give you the following, which is the method. And they ask you a couple of questions on that. Okay. Where I want to stand still here, and I'll just ask if there's anything I need to mention here, I will. But I just want to mention that always read your aim at least twice when you get an experiment. Okay. Because you will be asked two things when you are given an experiment. You will be asked a dependent variable, and you will be asked an independent variable for question uh, 3.5.1. And you will always get the answer of this from your aim. So this answer will come from the aim, which is here on top. Okay, now I'm going to just show you guys how you get the answer. So whenever you see the aim of an experiment, okay, let's read it, let's read it carefully. It says the learner is investigating something. What are they investigating? Investigating the effect of plant hormones on growth. So what is affecting what in this um, experiment? The hormones are gonna affect the plant growth, isn't it? Okay, now whatever is being affected, I can put it that way, okay, or being affected. What is being affected? The growth. So the growth is the one that's being affected. What is causing an effect on the growth? It's the plant hormones. So you have to ask yourself, okay, what am I investigating? I'm investigating, plant growth. What is having an effect on the plant growth? The plant hormones. All right. Now with those two facts in your head, the growth is being investigated and the plant hormone, the plant hormones has an effect on the growth. You can easily identify the dependent and the independent variable. Please make a note of this. Your dependent variable, I'm going to start there by B. Your dependent variable is the variable that is being affected or that is being um, investigated. That is the dependent variable. And who can tell me in the chat? What did I say now? Which one is being affected or which one is being investigated? That's going to be your dependent variable. Okay. Your independent variable is what will have an effect on your dependent variable, meaning the thing that's causing a change in the dependent variable. And that was the plant hormones over there as well. So your dependent variable grade 12s will always be what is being investigated or being affected. That was growth. So growth will be dependent. Your independent variable is the thing that's affecting the dependent variable or the growth. And that was the 
plant hormones. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Just give me a thumbs up if it made sense or just put your hand up if you must go through it again because that's really important to understand that your dependent variable is what you are investigating or that's being affected and your independent variable is the thing that is having an effect on your dependent variable. Okay, so now we know it's plant hormones and now we know it's the growth. Okay, so if you read further, you will see that the person is cutting a shoot and then she's putting it back um, by the second uh, part of the experiment. And the first part, she's cutting the shoot and she's leaving the shoot off. Okay, and I want you guys to work through this actually. And um, you'll see when you answer the questions that your answers will be very, very similar to what I said. It will actually be exactly that. Um, but I want to just mention one last thing here, and that is uh, 3.5.3, which is how Lesejo improved the reliability. And I just want to stand still by the reliability. When you are asked for, for reliability, you must look at two things. Who can tell me what those two things are? I'm sure your teacher hammered that into your head. Okay, that's going to be easy. I'll wait for that in the chat. Then you are also asked how something is kept valid. That is also called the validity. And your teacher would have mentioned this to you as well, but I want to speak about the validity quickly. So tell me in the chat, what do you look for if you are asked for reliability? And I'll tell you quickly what you need to know for validity. When you must look at something that is valid, you have to see what was kept the same. So make a note of this for yourself. Valid or validity, means what was kept the same. So same plant species, same knife, same condition, same environment, same soil, same person, same time of day, etc. Anything that was kept the same, that would be having to do with the validity. So validity or validness, what was kept the same. And it has to do with what's in the experiment. So you could say, um, she so used the same species of shoot or same plant. She so used the same knife to cut the, the plant open. She so used the same soil. It was the same temperature, anything the same. Okay. When it comes to 3.5.3, I see perseverance in the chat gave us the answer. Repeat the investigation and increase the sample size. Absolutely correct. Okay. When you are looking at reliability, repeat. So I always teach my learners reliability, repeat. Reliable, repeat. Okay. Make that in your head a kind of a rhyme. Reliable, repeat. And increase the sample size. And it's as simple as that. So 3.5.3, she could increase the sample size and repeat the investigation. And 3.5.4, she used the same uh, species of shoot, same plant, same soil, same knife, same time of day, same person doing the experiment, etc., etc. Okay. Any questions for this experiment? That's the two things I wanted to mention there. The memo will be provided to you guys. Um, I will just very quickly show it. Um, but you guys will have the memo. If there's no questions, I will move on to session two. So this was just 3.5.1. Any questions from anyone with regards to 3.5 or the experiment or the variables or the validity and the reliability? If not, we are hitting session two. OK, there is no questions, right? Uh, I'm going to move on to session two and in session two, I'm going to change a bit of tact. OK, I've now done a lot of legwork in paper one with regards to um, the multiple choice question yesterday. So here's what I'm going to do for you guys today. OK, I want you to show me what you've learned and I want you to show me if you can apply what you have learned for session two. I'm going to give you guys exactly five minutes. Um, to quickly work through section A, that's the multiple choice for question one. Um, then you can work, that's gonna, I'm gonna give up, up until 10 past one for that. And then we're gonna look at 1.2, which is the biological terms. You're also gonna do that on your own and we're gonna mark. And then finally, we're gonna look at 1.3, okay? So all of that together, that's gonna give us about 10, 15 minutes, but I'm gonna stop every five minutes just to mark, okay? So I want you guys to start just on a piece of paper if you haven't done this yet, to answer the multiple choice for about five minutes, just from number one up until as far as you can. And if you are finished before the five minutes, please go on to 1.2.
Um, I'll give another two or three minutes for that. And then lastly, we'll spend about just three minutes on 1.3, go to 1.3. Okay, so starting now, you guys can start. If I can ask the teachers to please make sure the learners do this. If you've done this, just move on to the questions um, and I'll keep to that. But let me see how well you guys can answer section A, starting with the multiple choice. We have five minutes starting now. Please get to work. We have about two minutes for the multiple choice.
Okay, you should be done with the multiple choice. I'm going to give another minute. If you are done, please move on to 1.2 biological terms. So we'll mark it now now. So those who are done, just move on to 1.2. I'm going to give another two or so minutes for the rest to just catch up with the multiple choice. I see some funny secondary as, as the answers. We'll check the answers in a minute or so, some funny. See how many you got correct for the multiple choice. I'm just waiting for everyone else to catch up. Can I ask uh, just the teachers or the learners to give me a thumbs up if the learners are done with the multiple choice so I can have an indication. Otherwise, we'll, we'll wait. Right, so I'm assuming everyone is by 1.2. Um, if not, that's okay. I'm just going to put up the answers for the multiple choice. You are welcome to continue to 1.2 uh, if you have are done marking, and it will mark 1.2 as well. So for the multiple choice, uh, number 1.1, there we go. You guys can see it. Here we go. So just mark yourself. We'll go through it in a second. Um, if there's anything I need to explain, please do let me know. Like example 1.10, just explain that. I'll be happy to. Dear colleagues who are in charge of the session in the classroom, if you scroll up in the chat, you will find the link to the register and you will also find the link to the feedback form. The last link was sent at 1.08 p.m. So you can either click on the link or you can scan the QR code. Thank you. OK, I see no questions for the multiple choice. I'm going to assume everyone is OK on that one. We are now busy with Right, are there any questions for the multiple choice or for 1.2? I will go, I uh, will put up the memo again. 
But if there's any questions from any teacher in the classroom that I need to explain 1.1 or 1.2, I will gladly do that from any learner. Otherwise, I'll leave a 1.2 for a few more minutes. If you are done, you can go to 1.3, but I think most of us are still busy with 1.2, which I'll leave up for another couple of minutes. Anyone still busy with 1.2? Otherwise, I will put up the memo and I'll go through. Um, I'll put up 1.1 again for those who must still mark. But are there any questions or anyone still busy with 1.2? Please raise your hand or just send the message in the chat. Okay, let's quickly look at the answer. So this was 1.1.1. 1. 1. 1. 1. I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit and go to 1.2 so you guys can see that. I see there's a question in the chat for 1.5, 1.1.5. I'm just going to go do that one. The answer was D. Let's just see quickly for 1.1.5. Part label B. So I see the question is, uh, isn't it supposed to be A with a centrosome? Part label B is the centromere. I will check that if centrosome is accepted, but I think, um, yeah, I think centromere is the most correct answer there for part B, but I will just check that for you. But in, yeah, as far as I can tell, that's the most correct one. Any questions for 1.2? There is 1.2. You may go on to 1.3. Um, I'll wrap it up now in a few minutes, but you may continue to 
Okay, going to 1.3, anyone still busy? Or can we look at that? And I will discuss any questions at the end of 1.3. Okay, let me just put up 1.3 quickly. It is 1.3. Okay, I see a couple of answers in the chat. Um, this is the end of uh, 1.3. Uh, let me just see um, if everyone is done marking. I'm just going to go up again to double check. Otherwise, I'm going to assume you guys are okay and we can move on to 1.4. So we have worked through the multiple choice. Um, I just want to mention here for paper two. OK, so paper two, as I spoke about yesterday with paper one, you always, uh, with, when it comes to multiple choice, excuse me, you always try and eliminate what the answer couldn't be. And you always try and um, as far as possible, excuse me, to choose one letter only. OK, so with section A, the multiple choice and with 1.2, this is uh, and 1.3, your bread and butter questions, and we will always make sure we get most of our marks there. Okay, let me just check if there's any questions for 1.2 and 1.1. I see 1.5 is a bit of a contention. Let's go to 1.5 quickly. So here was 1.5. It says the cell diagram below shows two pairs of chromosomes from a sperm cell belonging to timber who is planning to be the father of the child. So they're giving you this diagram here. So if we label this um, diagram initially, um, we know A is going to be your syndrome here, B is your spindle fiber, uh, C would be your homologous chromosomes or your bivalent where they cross over. We don't usually do that anymore um, or give the answer bivalent. But let's see what the question says. The part labeled B, um, centrosome, gonosome, autosome, centromere. So your centromere would be in the middle. I think 1.1.5's answer was D, which said centromere. Um, that should be A, so it can't be the centromere. So that would be a mistake there. Thank you for the schools that flag that. So it can't be um, the centromere part B, because as you can see, let me just get my laser pointer up. Part B is pointing to that where my laser pointer is, and that appears to be your spindle fiber. I think in this case, the most uh, correct answer, if it's not the inner option, would be your central zone. Um, I think that was flagged by someone um, because that would only that would be the most correct answer there. Okay, so it can't be the central here. It has to be the central zone, or it can be, it, the correct answer is actually the spindle fiber. So I will mention that to um, the subject advisor as well. Any other questions for 1.1, for 1.2, 1.3 we did. And then we are now going to go to 1.4. Okay, so 1.4 uh, was very, very straightforward. Um, I actually wanted us to work through this, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have a chance to work through this. So if I can ask the teachers um, to work through this with your learners and then make them come back to the memo. It's, a, it's an abstract you must read and then just answer the questions on that. Okay, it's nothing hectic, but if you do want me to mention something, yeah, well, otherwise it's just a, an abstract you have to read and answering the question. So with your permission, um, I'm going to skip through this one. Otherwise, if there's a question, I'll be happy to come back to it. Okay, uh, 1.5 um, year has to do with gene transfer. 
Um, it says scientists are able to do direct gene transfer across species in order to have the desired trait. 1.5.1, uh, you must mention four advantages of food that is produced by organisms which has a gene transfer. So we're talking about GMOs there, and you would have learned in class, you have better crop production, um, bigger fruit, seedless fruit, etc. Any four of those, um, that was quite simple as well. And 1.5.2 says, explain why the above procedure, as highlighted in the statement, may not be regarded as cloning. So I wanted to stand still by this one quickly, okay? And just to ask you to have a little um, chat uh, with your um, learners or the learners with their friends and just quickly discuss what is the difference between gene transfer and cloning. And let's just see if we can get to this answer because this is a higher, bit of a high order question. You have to be able to understand the difference. So I wanna give about just so 30 seconds for you to discuss. What do you guys think? What is the, and you all have to tell me one difference. What is the one difference or more between gene transfer and gene cloning um, um, or cloning in fact, and why what the scientists are doing is not regarded as cloning. Just a quick 30 seconds and I'll see what we get, what we get through in the chat. You can start now. Can I give another 10 seconds? So what is the difference between gene transfer and cloning? If you know the answer, you can uh, throw it in the chat. I will speak about it now. Right, so let's talk about cloning. Um, when we speak about cloning, and I hope you guys uh, chatted about this, cloning and gene transfer, this is something that, that could pop up in your paper too. So when you clone something, okay, like let's say the first sheep that was cloned, um, Dolly, then you basically clone or copy the entire complement of the person's chromosomes or the um, person's genome or the animal's genome, and you place it into another cell and, the, and that animal is cloned. But when you gene transfer something, then you are basically taking a piece of gene or a, a small piece of gene and you're putting it into another organism. I see there is a message coming through on the chat. Gene cloning is the process in which genes of the interest is located and copied out of all the DNA extracted from the organism. Okay, correct. So when we clone something, I see that's Bella or hi. Uh, thank you. When we clone something, we take the entire DNA and we just copy it, okay? So that is what you need to understand for cloning. You take the entire complement of DNA as it is and you clone it and that's gonna be identical to wherever you got the DNA from, to the parent or to the um, origin. But when you transfer something, you are taking a gene from one organism. So let's say you like the taste of oranges in oranges, you take out the gene for oranges and let's say you want that same taste in grapes. Just making a random example and you copy that piece of gene that gives the orange its, its taste and you put it into another um, organism or another cell like grapes, which tastes differently. And now you've altered that grapes genetic makeup. So cloning is when we copy the DNA as it is and it is identical, but gene transfer, it is not identical. And I want you guys to please remember that, okay, going into your final exams, gene transfer, means that the DNA is not identical to the parent or to the origin of where the DNA came from, whereas cloning means it is exactly identical. It is basically the same thing. And I'm just going to show that to you guys over here um, in the words or in the words that it was put here. That is that the gene transfer requires altering your genetic identity, meaning that you change the DNA of the organism, you alter it. 
whereas cloning does not involve any manipulation or it means that there is an identical or rather that the genes is identical to the parent or to the original organism. Okay, so just keep that in mind that gene transfer, you alter the genetic identity, whereas cloning does not involve manipulating the genes. Okay, and I hope that makes sense to you guys. I just wanted to stand still by that one. And that is section A. Um, I think we've wrapped up section A. I'm going to go to section B. Uh, I'm probably going to only finish question two and then wrap up question three on Thursday. But if there's anything for section A I need to go over, I'm just standing still now for anyone who wants me to go through anything. We know now for question 1.1.5, um, B can't be the central here. It has to be the spindle fiber. So we know that's a mistake. Um, but if there's anything else for the other questions like 1.2 or 1.3, or even for what we just did now, then I'm going to continue if there's no other questions. Uh, sir, you have 15 minutes, 13 minutes remaining for the session. No problem. Thank you. Right. So for question two, um, you are dealing here with another, ex another extract that you have to read, but another type of reading type question where you have to read the information that's given and you have to answer the questions that is given for you. OK, so we're not going to work through this one. I'm going to just ask if there's any clarity that's needed here. Uh, from anyone because I want to get to uh, question 2.2, which has to do with the DNA. But um, if you learners can please work through this, I just want to mention uh, two things here, or one or two things that is this question, which has to do with speciation. And I want to talk about 2.2 um, a bit later. Okay. So in this extract, I want you guys to work through this when you have time. You have to read what's happening here. It's basically someone who, um, excuse me, who has a mice um, in different um, areas. So there's group A, um, there's group B, and there's group C. So meaning that you started out with one population of, of mouse and they got split up and they split by a physical barrier. So this should now already remind you of uh, speciation here, okay? And then it explains to you that individuals groups A and B are able to interbreed. So meaning A and B, they can interbreed and they can have offspring. Whereas B and C, they can't interbreed and they can't have offspring. Okay, so you can work through this. Um, it's quite simple, 2.1.1. 2.1.2 um, is what I just wanted to uh, stand still by if, if, if you allow me just for a minute or so. But if there's a question on this, I will happily go over it. But 2.1.2 says, using the diagram, explain the process of speciation that occurs in the original mouse population. And when it comes to speciation, there's one thing, or there's two types you need to know, but there's only one that I want you to study, and that is speciation through geographical isolation, okay? And that is also in your exam guideline. So when it comes to speciation through geographical isolation, please, please study that, because they will always ask that, and it will always be six marks, okay? And I just want to show you guys what to look out for for that one. So remember with speciation, you are speaking about a physical barrier, okay? Um, and when it comes to the physical barrier, you have to start out, as it says in the exam guideline, that a population is separated, as you can see here, by a physical barrier. In this case, it was the gullies. And then the groups or the species A and B, they are in similar conditions. Um, group C was in a different um, condition, and then natural selection happened independently. Now, I know your teacher would have taught you this. So what I want you guys to do is please to work through this and then to just see if you can write out the answer, studying it from the exam guideline based on the question that's given. You always mention the barrier. In this case, it's the gullies. If it was a mountain or whatever, you mentioned that there was similar conditions and then one of them had a different condition and then natural selection happened and they were phenotypically and genotypically suitable to interbreed and then the individuals excuse me, A and B were then phenotypically and genotypically different. There was no gene flow and therefore there was a new species. Okay, so focus on that one for me when you're studying speciation to geographic isolation. That's going to be very, very important. I see there's a question for the answer for 1.5.1. So here's 1.5.1. It was just food can be produced more cheaply. Um, 
pests can attack the crop uh, less. Uh, the food have a longer shelf life. Um, the crops require less chemicals, all of that. Okay, we will send you this memo. And then I see it was for 1.4, is it 1.4.1 1 in 2? Um, so this is just from the extract. Okay, I will I will send or this memo will be sent to you guys. Okay, so don't worry about that. Um, so question two isn't so bad. Okay, it's actually quite simple. If you guys work through it, it isn't bad at all. Okay, I want to stand still by this one uh, for a couple of minutes. In fact, for the, probably until our, our session is done and we will pick it up on Thursday. This has to do with the table that shows you the anticodons of tRNA that is collected for a particular amino acid during protein synthesis. So you will always be always be given something with regards to protein synthesis in the paper two. And this is the bread and butter marks where you can get the marks quite easily. Okay, 1.4 and 1.5 was more of application. You had to just read stuff and apply it. But 2.2 is actually something that if you know how to answer it, you can answer it quite clearly. So let's look at this. So here is your um, amino acids. There's a the tRNA codons. And then 2.2.1 says, write down the DNA base triplet for the codes, uh, for the or triplet codes for the amino acid valin. So if we look at where valin is, it's at number two. Okay. And then it's also at number four. And then it's also at number nine. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to write down the DNA triplet or base triplet codes for number two valine, number three, sorry, number four valine, and number nine valine. So you are given the tRNA. Please write down the DNA triplets for two, four, and nine. I'm going to give you guys a minute to do that. Okay, so this is just to help you guys through this. I know um, I'm getting a lot of requests for memos. You guys will get the memo, but I just want to make sure that you guys can do the stuff with the marks, where you can get marks easily without making any mistakes. So let's see if we can just write down 2.2.1 quickly. Fastest person in the chat. So I'm looking for the DNA code for Valin at, at number four, at number nine, and as well as number two. Right, so I'm assuming you guys are all done. Uh, so remember when you write the DNA triplet, uh, you are given the tRNA. So you have to go tRNA, first you go mRNA, and then you get to the DNA codons for um, the valine. Okay, so let's see who got the answers correct. So it's 2.1.1. Um, sorry, it's the one over, did I know? Write this down 2.2.1. There we go. So it's G T A C A C and then C A G. Remember, you have to use T and not U because you are working on the DNA codon. Okay. Then 2.2.2 uh, 2 .2 was asked what was the codon for 309? Uh, uh, 309. 309 is obviously. Um, given to you there as UCC on the tRNA. If you are asked for the codon, okay, remember this, if you don't know it, you must give the mRNA codon. So the code, if you have um, UCC over there, and then it'll be AGG on the um, codon for the RNA. Okay, so that will be AGG. And in 2.2.3, said from the table, write down the names of two amino acids which were coded for uh, by thymine as the first uh, DNA base. So this one is a bit tricky. 
Okay, so if you look at 2.2.3, you have to identify the two amino acids that are coded for by thymine as the first DNA base. So how are we going to figure this one out? You're going to have to go from the DNA to the mRNA to the tRNA. And in this case, we have to look for what would have started with the letter T to give you the tRNA. Anyone in the chat that can give us this one? You do must give me a name, valine, alanine, which one it is. Anyone have an answer? Okay, let's let's talk about this one quickly. So remember, if you want to know what the D, what the amino acid is that started with T, you must now remember from T you went to the mRNA, and that will change to U, and then you went to the tRNA for that one as well. Okay, so for 2.2.3, you had to tell me it's cytosine and 309, and the reason there is that they start with U. So you can clearly see the at number seven, cytosine starts with U. That means the mRNA, excuse me, back into the tRNA of the, the DNA must have been a T to start with the. So whatever starts with U, that would be where the first code on the DNA was T. So UGC as well as UCC, cytosine and 309. And then 2.2.4, um, just almost finish off, you must name and describe the process that occurred in the cytoplasm. Now, without giving me the steps, who can tell me what is going to occur in the cytoplasm? There are three processes. Uh, replication, where does that happen? Transcription, where does that happen? And then translation, where does that happen? So one of those three is going to be the answer for 2.2.4. And the clue they give you, it's the one that happens in the cytoplasm um, that leads to amino acid number 11, becoming part of a protein. And there's another clue that's given to you there. So usually what, what jumps into your brain as a grade 12 learner when you read about a process um, that happens is transcription, isn't it? And I'm sure your teacher taught you that transcription is what they ask a lot, and that's true. But they give you another clue here. They're saying it happens in the cytoplasm. And my question to you is, where, where does transcription happen? Does it happen in the nucleus or does it happen in the cytoplasm? as well as the replication, that only happens in the nucleus, so it can't be replication. But both transcription and translation will give you um, a protein, but when they tell you it happens in the cytoplasm, and when they tell you it happens to form part of a protein, the only thing that jumps to your head must be translation. And I'm just gonna show you the answer for translation. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the answer is translation, obviously, and then that would be a compulsory mark if you got that right. If you got it wrong, and then you would just lose a mark there. But the rest is still the same. Okay. So it says the codon UAU and of the mRNA is there, was exposed. And then that was exposed by the ribosome. The tRNA was then complementary to the anticodon AUA. And then that's brought the amino acid tyrosine from the cytoplasm to the ribosome and it is then bonded by the neighboring previous amino acid by via a peptide bond, okay? And you have to explain it in that way um, in the exam. I know that this is not something you guys was hammered on. Usually we hammer on transcription, but please grade 12, make sure you also know translation as that is something that you will also be asked, okay? That is all we're going to have time for today. I will pick it up with um, 2.3 on Thursday. If I can ask you on Thursday, we will have a an, an hour or so just to con consolidate everything. But if I can please ask teachers um, that by Thursday, you're going to have lots of time that you work through the rest of paper two, okay, including the rest of question two and question three as well. Please learn us uh, work through this and finish it so that when we see each other on Thursday, that we um, go through the, the question paper a lot quicker. I will then just ask if there's any question I need to do in detail. Otherwise, I'll just go through the answers and I'm gonna assume that you guys have done it um, on Thursday and just go through the answers. But if there's any question I need to go through, I will, but please work through the rest of paper two. And on Thursday as well, we will have a consolidation 
where I will give you a kind of a post test just to see what you guys have learned. Okay. Thank you for that, teachers and learners. I know it was a bit of a rushed session today. You will all have access to the recording. If I can please ask you once again to just work through the rest of the paper. And then um, on Thursday, we will discuss the rest of the paper. Thank you for your attention and thank you for listening. And I will see you guys again on Thursday uh, morning. Thank you so much.